Um, doctor, I can't take a statin. Most of the patients who see me see me because drugs aren't working. I'm never their first cardiologist. Physicians in my community are not happy with me and the way I've been practicing medicine um, the last 20 years. Um, just as an aside, uh, 25 years ago, I was tied with two other guys as leading emitter of cardiology patients to my primary hospital. I lived in the ICU doing invasive procedures. There's an eight bed corny care unit at that hospital and one Tuesday afternoon for a two hour period, all eight charts have blue stickers to signify they were Robert's patients. I was just doing all these invasive procedures, making a ridiculous amount of money, and everybody was really happy with me. And then, of course, my, my approach changed when my patients went behind my back to Dr. Chapel, got chelation therapy, got better. I began to move away from the dark side of the force and into the light. Um, but anyways, um, people in my community don't see me as their first cardiologist because doctors are kind of upset with me for being different. Um, but the people who will see me are those, I can't take a statin. They were discharged from the hospital on 80 milligrams of atorvastatin. All of a sudden they're depressed, their mus muscles ache, and they have erectile dysfunction. They wanna know, is there something else they can take? And allopathic medicine offers you nothing. However, in um, integrative medicine, we have a number of methodologies to block HM reductase in a non-pharmaceutical format. These herbal therapies are uh, more easily amenable to hepatic biotransformation, so we're far less likely to have statin side effects with the nutraceutical, or I'll call them green statins. We can get statin-like side effects, but they are typically uh, less frequently encountered. And here we can use Reggie's rice extract, oil of bergamot, um, amla, or delta tocotrienols to downregulate HM reductase. And again, all statins do is block HM reductase. All the benefits have to do with blocking the generation of cholesterol, blocking the generation of isoprenoids, um, thus rho kinase is not activated, NADPH oxidase is not activated, we stop making excessive superoxide, we stop translocating nuclear factor kappa beta to the nucleus, so that's why statins are working. Yes, they lower cholesterol, but they have an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effect, which is shared by all all these green agents that will block HMV reductase. And there's an extensive literature to support this. I will present to you some of the studies. More are available on my website. Um, so, doctor, I can't take a statin. What are we going to do? Well, first of all, some, but not all, of statin myopathy has to do with um, coenzyme Q deficiency. Without coenzyme Q, you can't transport electrons. Um, not only do you get muscle pain, you get diastolic dysfunction. If you look at um, left ventricular filling characteristics, before or after statin therapy, everybody gets diastolic dysfunction because we're compromising um, ATP recycling because you can't transport electrons because you don't have any coenzyme Q. You can rectify that with CoQ supplementation. Ribose will help you jumpstart um, ATP recycling. If you've washed out all your adenucleotides, it takes a long time to make AMP. Ribose will help. So if the patient comes in with statin muscle pain, one thing you can do is give them coenzyme Q and ribose, and many but not all patients will get better. So if you can't stop the statin, you can at least mitigate the myopathy with CoQ and ribose. We use drugs to good effect in cardiovascular medicine and allopathic medicine. I don't think there's any drug that does not cause a nutritional deficiency. We must recognize and fill in the nutritional deficiency, then we get the good without the bad. Berberine, as we have discussed, um, works before and after the level of HM reductase. Berberine upregulates AMP sensitive protein kinase, which will phosphorylate and thus acutely downregulate the expression of HM reductase. When we take a statin or when we utilize any method, including diet, to lower cholesterol, we're lowering the generation, uh, the expression of cholesterol within the hepatocyte. That will lead to translocation of the um, sterile regulatory element binding protein, and you're going to start making more LDL receptors. That's a good thing. Um, you're also going to start making more HM reductase. That's a bad thing. And you're going to make PCSK9. Um, and PCSK9 will degrade the LDL receptor, um, and, and then cholesterol will rise again. Well, berberine. Will, uh, will park itself on the start site for PCSK9 and blunt transcription of PCSK9. So in a sense, statin therapy, it works, but it sows the seeds for statin failure. So you give the patient a statin, their cholesterol falls, 
A year later, it's back up again. Maybe not to baseline, but it's up again. Why is that happening? Well, I used to think, gee, we're getting complacent. The, the patient no longer feels the need to follow the diet because they're on a statin. And part of that's true. But when we lower um, uh, cholesterol with the statin by blocking um, h mcl reductase, we are going to lead to more LDL receptors, yes, but more h mcl reductase and more importantly, more PCSK9. You can block that with berberine. So basically, if you have a patient on 40 milligrams of atorvastatin and you put them on berberine, 500 milligrams twice a day, you can lower the atorvastatin from 40 to 20 milligrams and you'll get the same effect on lipids and you'll get the same effect on downstream inflammation. Plus, berberine improves insulin sensitivity. Statins worsen insulin sensitivity. Berberine improves it, and berberine will also block um, assembly of NADPH oxidase in a pathological circumstance, so you're going to get more of an anti-inflammatory effect. So this is something I do with everybody. Everybody who's taking a statin, you might as well add in berberine. You're going to get a nice synergy. 5 to 10% of people get nuisance GI side effects, constipation or diarrhea, cut back on the dose. We have Reggie's rice extract, oil of bergamot, amylaberry, delta gamma tocotrienol therapy. So again, let's talk about this LDL receptor negative feedback. Um, synthesis and expression of the LDL receptor relates to the perceived need of the cell, particularly hepatocyte for cholesterol. If we have adequate intracellular cholesterol, the LDL receptor is withdrawn. So in theory, we cannot overfill our cells with cholesterol. If we have enough cholesterol, we withdraw the LDL receptor. Of course, this process can be bypassed um, in the presence of, of uh, inflammation, oxidative stress, but that's how Mother Nature designed us to function. So we have the sterile regulatory element that is the promoter site for the LDL receptor protein. So transcription here will lead to more LDL receptor proteins, more greater expression of the LDL receptor protein on the hepatocyte cell membrane. You're going to pull cholesterol out of the circulation. You're going to lower the serum cholesterol. That's what you want. So we've got um, the sterile regulatory element binding protein which if it, if it is translocated to the nucleus, binds the SRE, and we're going to make LDL receptor protein. Now, it is held in abeyance in the endoplasmic reticulum by NSIG. NSIG will be monitoring the level of free cholesterol, not a sterified cholesterol, not oxidized cholesterol, but free cholesterol within the, within the um, cytoplasm. Um, when there's enough cholesterol present, it will sequester SREBP and SCAP which is sterile regulatory element binding protein, cleavage activating protein um, in the endoplasmic reticulum. If we have a reduction in free cholesterol within the cell due to starvation or dietary modification or um, statin therapy, NSIG will sense that it'll let go and then SCAP will escort SRABP to the Golgi apparatus. It will cleave off some amino acids and then SREBP translocates the nucleus um, and transcribes uh, messenger RNA for LDL receptor synthesis. So we're only going to make these LDL receptors when the liver needs free cholesterol. So the interaction between SREBP and it, the start site of the DNA leads to more LDL receptor protein, and that will pull cholesterol out of the circulation, leading to a reduction in serum cholesterol. Um, and that makes sense in therapy in hyperlipidemia and cardiovascular disease. But Mother Nature did not set up this process to make us good statin patients. She generated this pathway to help us survive. Now, consider if, if you're a primitive man, what are the situations in which your hepatic cholesterol would be low? Now, you're not voluntarily going on a diet. You're not taking statins. The only situation where the liver would not have enough cholesterol to meet its um, to fulfill its responsibilities would be starvation. So the, if you are starving, you're going to have a low level of cholesterol in the liver. So the liver is starved of cholesterol. So yeah, you're going to translocate SREBP to the nucleus and you're going to make more LDL receptors to pull cholesterol out of the circulation to help the liver meet its needs. And again, you're going to start making more um, cholesterol. HMC reductase transcription will be increased. So now the liver is happy. It's getting cholesterol. It's making more cholesterol. It's taking out of the circulation. But what about the rest of the body? Mother Nature did not design us simply to have um, functionally healthy livers. We want 
a functionally healthy body. So if the liver is stealing all the cholesterol from the rest of the body, there needs to be a break. Um, and that is PCSK9, proprotein convertase subtilisin kexin type 9. And it will be transcribed along with the LDL receptor protein, HM reductase, and PCSK9 will degrade the LDL receptor. So there's a balancing act. When Mother Nature takes a step in one direction, she always creates an equal and opposite step in the opposite direction to provide balance. Now, this PCSK9 will degrade the LDL receptor, blunt return of LDL to the liver, raise the circulating LDL, um, and this will thwart our attempts to lower cholesterol with statin therapy. And its expression is increased by lipopolysaccharide and inflammatory cytokines. So when we're infected, when we're inflamed, we're expect, exposed to oxidative inflammatory stress, as all of our patients are, as all of us are living in um, uh, urban uh, Western civilization, um, we're making too much PCSK9, and this is playing a role in hyperlipidemia. Um, there are individuals with genomic upregulations in PCSK9, and that's one cause of genetic um, hyperlipidemia. So PCSK9 is important. Um, in, in the survival of, of primitive man under starvation, but it is a, a problem. It's working against us when we wish to lower circulating cholesterol with diet or drug therapy because it's degrading the LDL receptor, blunts return of LDL to the liver, raises circulating LDL. Um, and again, we have this missed decision to increase cholesterol production. Modern living is associated with toxicity, bad diet, diabetes, sleep apnea, etc. We're getting all this inflammation, oxidative stress. We're upgrading the HM core reductase because Mother Nature thinks we're fighting an infection. Um, this is a maladaptive response. We make isoprenoid molecules that um, upregulate rho kinase, more NADPH oxidase. So we're on this constant war footing because we're fighting the pseudo infection of the oxidative. And uh, uh, inflammatory cues associated with modern living. Um, so we're going to we're going to make um, NAPX oxidase will be uh, upregulated. We're going to make uh, free radicals to help our white cells fight infection. That would be appropriate in a real infection. It's inappropriate in the pseudo infection um, milieu that we're experiencing. Whenever we make oxidative stress, we have superoxide. It'll go to peroxide. It's going to shoot nuclear factor kappa beta to the nucleus. More inflammatory cytokines. Um, in this process, NADPH oxidase is upregulated. Uh, nuclear factor kappa beta translocates. Another um, inflammation application pathway, activated protein 1, is upregulated. We're going to turn off nerve 2. We don't want antioxidants. We want free radicals to kill the microbes. But this, of course, is a problem when the target of the dysregulated immune response is the intima or the myocyte in atherosclerosis or heart failure. This process is working against us. Um, Monocyte cholesterol metabolism. So the SREBP, SCAP, SRE, PCSK9 physiology has to do with the LDL receptor interacting with native LDL. And this, process, this negative feedback, of course, will be blocked when lipids are oxidized. When lipids are oxidized, they no longer ligate the LDL receptor. They no longer look like food. They will be ligated by the scavenger or the LOX or the CD36 receptor on mononuclear cells. They will be internalized. And then we get foam cells and um, the setting of atherosclerosis. Monocyte lipid engorgement. Now, in the situation of legitimate infection or modern man's situation of pseudo-infection because we've accumulated visceral fat, we have a bad diet, we have heavy metals and organic pollutants, we're on this constant war footing, the liver becomes a generator of LDL cholesterol. So it's cranking up HM reductase. Um, it's making lots of PCASK9. It's degrading the LDL receptor. We're making lots of lipid to be transported to the periphery to help fight this infection. So monocytes will engorge with lipids because these monocytes are going to be proliferating. They need lipids for cell membranes to help fight this infection. So in infection or oxidative inflammatory stress, the liver starts making lipids. It's transported to the periphery. And peripheral cells, including mononuclear cells, will engorge with lipids. That's clearly deleterious in atherosclerosis. As these lipids become oxidized, we get foam cells, we get atherosclerosis. So the negative feedback mechanism that would tend to prevent monocyte lipid overload is bypassed. And 
Um, the mechanism is that when we're making these inflammatory cytokines um, via translocation nuclear factor kappa beta, that will stimulate the enzymes that esterify cholesterol. So if you have a given quantity of, of cholesterol in the mononuclear cell, and all of a sudden we're esterifying it, then free cholesterol levels will fall. The SCAP, SREBP, SRE negative feedback interaction is sensitive only to free cholesterol. So if all of a sudden we esterify our cholesterol, there's less free cholesterol, and then we're going to get more um, SREBP translocation of the nucleus. We're going to make more h reductase. We're going to make more LDL receptors. So those mononuclear cells are going to scarf up more than their fair share of lipid from the circulation because we are um, bypassing, in a sense, the negative feedback mechanism, foam cells, atherosclerosis. So our patients are suffering from inflammation-induced dyslipidemia, and we can blunt this with anti-inflammatory antioxidant therapies. In this experimental model, animals were exposed to lipopolysaccharide. So lipopolysaccharide is going to lead to nuclear factor cap beta translocation, generation of inflammatory mediators, leading to oxidative stress, more nuclear factor cap beta translocation, a ongoing vicious cycle. So you'll see an upregulation in generation of Th1 cytokines or Th17 cytokines here interfering gamma. That is blunted by co-treatment with berberine. LDL, re LDL receptor protein expression is blunted by lipopolysaccharide. PCSK9 is upregulated. That's why you have lower LDL receptor protein expression because PCSK9 is blocking the LDL receptor that is blunted with berberine. So we have hyperlipidemia in experimental inflammation that is blunted with berberine. How is berberine working? Well, it's working at many levels, including downregulation of HMV reductase. So HMV reductase is the rate limiting step in the generation of cholesterol and oxidative inflammatory mediators because the isoprenoids lead to NADPH oxidase activation, superoxide generation, inflammatory cytokine generation, etc. So if we block h reductase via any methodology, we will downregulate production of cholesterol and oxidative inflammatory mediators. Um, now let's look at h reductase, pretty important um, enzyme because cholesterol is critical to the metabolism of every cell. So we can lower the expression of HM reductase on a moment-to-moment -moment level via phosphorylation and dephosphorylation. When this enzyme is phosphorylated, it is deactivated. AMP sensor protein kinase, when it is activated, when it's phosphorylated, will phosphorylate HM reductase and acutely deactivate it. Um, when it is phosphorylated, not only is it inactive, it is more likely to be degraded in the proteasomes. Um, it can be ubiquinated, and that leads to degradation we can directly poison the enzyme with statins and nutraceutical statins, and that will block generation of isoprenoids, oxidative inflammatory mediators, and cholesterol. And we can um, affect its production by uh, therapies that influence transcription and translation of h reductase. So um, we transcribe a messenger RNA. It translocates to the cytoplasm where on the ribosomal apparatus, the messenger RNA message is translated into protein. Um, so we have low intracellular cholesterol. Uh, SCAP allows SRABP to go to the nucleus. We're going to make messenger RNA for LDL receptor protein. Um, now, activated, phosphorylated, AMP sensor protein kinase will inactivate h reductase. So we activate AMPK, it will phosphorylate h reductase. Phosphorylated h reductase is inactive, and phosphorylated h reductase is degraded. So we take berberine, we upregulate AMPK, we downregulate h reductase. It no longer is, is generating isoprenoids, it's no longer generating cholesterol, it's more likely to be degraded. Um, we have this missed decision to increase cholesterol production. We're supposed to increase HM reductase activity in a legitimate infection, but we're living in a pseudo-infection environment, poor diet, 
visceral fat, sleep apnea, toxins. So we're constantly on war footing. We're up regulation of reductase, and we need to neutralize this by down-regulating it. And one mechanism is with berberine to increase amp kinase to down-regulate HM core reductase. Um, so we can block and we can also block this misdecision with statins, either pharmaceutical statins or nutraceutical statins, because we're really not that interested in lowering cholesterol. We're really interested in downregulating NADPH oxidase. There's a drug used in um, Japan called Facidil that blocks this step. And it won't lower cholesterol, but it blocks the generation of NADPH oxidase. So Probably most of the benefits of statin therapy would be recapitulated with this enzyme. It just doesn't lower cholesterol. And the idea is if you have atherosclerosis, but you have a normal cholesterol, why do we have to knock out cholesterol completely when our goal is to lower NAP oxidase? And it's used, I believe, in Japan. It'll never make it to the United States because we're so hooked on statins. Well, we would not accept a, uh, a non-statin agent to block NADPH oxidase. But if we could get our hands on that, we would use it to a good effect. And clinical trials in the Orient show that it is a value in atherosclerosis. Um, berberine, again, is my favorite nutraceutical. It upregulates AMP-sensitive protein kinase. Um, it will block the assembly of NADPH oxidase, so we're going to make less superoxide. At two steps, it will block nuclear factor capita translocation. It blocks activator, activator protein 1 translocation. It upregulates nerve 2. It does everything we want to deal with the misdecision um, to respond to the oxidative inflammatory milieu of modern man with upregulation of HM reductase. Um, it also will sit on the promoter site for PCS kind and block its transcription. And one of the negatives of statin therapy is that you have upregulated PCSK9 transcription, you degrade the LDL receptor, you have statin escape, berberine will block that. Um, so would berberine synergize with statin therapy um, in lipid control? Let's look at 30 subjects with heterozygous familial hyperlipidemia, 12 with receptor defective LDR uh, receptor uh, gene mutation, a third egg corneal disease, 25 prior rascalization, 18 with a receptor negative LDL R gene mutation, a 61 with corneal disease, a third with prior revascularization. So these people had genetic um, abnormalities that led to defective LDL receptor uh, expression on the hepatocyte. Therefore, the liver cannot. Uh, take lipids out of the circulation, you have hyperlipidemia. Now, this would be a value to primitive man who needed hyperlipidemia to non-specifically upregulate his immune system, but it's, of course, deleterious in the situation of modern man. These people are at increased risk for cardiovascular disease. So, you got these people with genomic hyperlipidemia. Most of them had cardiovascular disease. A third had prior revascularization. They're all on stable doses of maximally tolerated standard therapy. Statins to block HM reductase and azetamide to block um, uh, basically enteropatic recycling of cholesterol excreted by the liver in the form of bile salts. So you're on standard medical therapy. Baseline measurements, you're going to add in berberine, 500 milligrams a day. Berberine will physiologically downregulate HM reductase and more importantly, from our point of view, will block PCSK9. A small dose of red cheese rice and polycosinol, which are um, sort of background noise to high dose statin therapy with respect to inhibiting HM reductase. So the, the major um, uh, physiologic effect of this cocktail was berberine to block PCSK9. Repeat the baseline measurements in three months. What you see at baseline, they got a cholesterol of 384, LDL 305, with maximal statin and azitamide therapy. Um, cholesterol and LDL falls. If you add in the berberine cocktail, you get another 30 point drop. So there was a synergy here between berberine and standard um, statin and azetamide therapy. Um, no real change in HDL, a uh, slight benefit with respect to a triglyceride. So the percent reduction in uh, cholesterol with statin and statin plus azetamide was uh, 36%. If you add in the berberine, you go to 44%. Um, LDL percent reduction, 43% to 53%. Triglycerides, there was a slight additional benefit, 18% to 23%. Obviously, there was a synergy there. Now, um, they found that the 
efficacy of berberine fell with rising statin doses. So this was a, a study where they used a fixed dose of berberine, not a variable dose. And why would this be? Okay, so the greater the statin dose, the greater the expression of PCSK9, the more work for berberine to do. So um, statins lead to PCSK9, the greater the statin dose, the more PCSK9, just a fixed dose of berberine was less and less sufficient. So the greater the statin dose, the greater the percent reduction in LDL with the statin, the greater will be your relative need for berberine. So we typically pe treat people with 500 milligrams twice a day, but you might want to go higher because you need more because the greater the dose of statin, the more PCSK9, the more uh, you need to block PCSK9 transcription with berberine. Um, so how does berberine work? It tricks the body into thinking that energy failure is occurring. So the ratio of AMP to ATP is increased transiently. You're not really compromising energy generation, but the body is tricked. You activate AMP sensitive protein kinase. You will phosphorylate and downregulate H and reductase. Um, LDL receptor expression is increased and you block transcription of PCSK9, therefore a decrease in serum LDL. You know, whenever you transcribe a messenger RNA for the LDL receptor, it can be degraded before it hits the cytoplasm and can be translated in a protein. Berberine binds to the untranslated portion of the messenger RNA for the LDL receptor and stabilizes it. So for any given degree of increased transcription of LDL receptor protein, more will be translated with berberine on board, another synergy between berberine and all other lipid lowering therapies. You'll also phosphorylate and deactivate ACC carboxylase, which is the rate limiting step in fatty acid synthesis. So you're gonna decrease fatty acid synthesis. You're gonna increase fatty acid oxidation because um, AMPK sends the signal, burn things now to generate energy, don't build things. So we're not gonna build lipids, we're not gonna build triglycerides. Now, berberine will increase the uh, surface expression of the insulin receptor on all of our cells. It will also block um, insulin insensitivity on the basis of inflammation. Um, ICPA kinase that degrades ICPA that allows nuclear factor capillator transcript to the nucleus will also serine phosphorylate insulin receptor substrate one, and that's the that's why we have insulin insensitivity in response to infection or inflammation. So berberine will block that. So glucose control will improve. Um, insulin resistance due to saturated fatty acids, lipopolysaccharides, and Th1 cytokines will be blunted. So you can provide physiologic protection against diabetes and in animal models, diabetic uh, related complications, nephropathy, neuropathy, retinopathy, and cardiomyopathy. Berberine works in animal models, presumably the same in humans. Um, it helps us with weight. It lowers oxidative inflammatory stress. It blocks assembly of NADPH oxidase in response to pathologic stimuli. We make less superoxide. Um, we promote um, NERF2 translocation. We blunt nuclear factor kappa beta and activate a protein 1 translocation. So a lower elaboration of, of oxidative mediators and inflammatory mediators. Um, endothelial function improves. There's beneficial effects on cardiovascular physiology. And clinically, it's a value in all cardiovascular conditions and in all of our risk factors, um, particularly improving outcome uh, following step placement for ACS and a value in heart failure. Berberine synergizes with and adds to pharmaceutical uh, measures. So I can't think of a good reason not to put everybody we see on berberine. If you take graduate students who are the control groups in many of the studies, who take berberine, these normal people become a little bit more normal. Their lipids get a little bit better, endothelial function gets a little better. Again, there are very few humans in Western society that are really optimal. We're just not sick yet, and we make you more optimal, more healthy with berberine due to these wonderful beneficial effects. Um, Reggie's rice is, um, Reggie's rice extract for lipid reduction is Reggie's Monascus purpris grown on rice. This is an extract, and there's really no yeast in it. It is an extract of red yeast grown on rice. It's a typical component of the Asian diet. It's used to make rice wine. It's a food preservative used to maintain the color and taste of fish and meat in the Orient. Um, and red yeast rice extract 
contains a small amount of lovastatin. So lovastatin is generated when red yeast rice grow on rice. Thus, it's going to have a hyperlipidemic effect. Lovastatin, it was the first um, lip lowering drug to be used um, Mevacor. So um, you get a little bit of Mevacor in red yeast rice extract. There's also plant sterols, isoflavones, isoflavone glycosides, monosaturated fatty acids, a bunch of good things um, above and beyond. It, it provides a, a statin agent um, generated when red yeast is grown on rice. Um, the benefits of red yeast rice extract were described um, in the Tang Dynasty, 800 AD. The Ben Cao Gang Mu Dan Shi Bu Yi, the textbook of uh, Oriental Medicine in the Ming Dynasty, describes the benefits of red yeast rice. It is a standard lipid lowering and cardiovascular therapy in China. Lipid and metabolic benefits have been replicated in the Western populations. If we block HM reductase, we're going to block NADPH oxidase. We're going to block oxidative inflammatory stress. Obviously, this is going to be a value in patients with cardiovascular disease. Let's look at the effect of red yeast rice extract on lipid, CRP, and endothelial dysfunction in a Western population. 50 patients with stable coronary disease. Um, they're all on aspirin. You keep them on their beta blockers, their calcium blockers, their nitrates, and their ACE inhibitors. All receive dietary advice over four weeks. You look at lipids. You look at endothelial function. Fasting and after a high-fat meal. When we take in a high-fat meal, we will experience acute endothelial dysfunction. Um, randomized to receive over six weeks, red yeast rice 600 twice a day, not a huge dose, but a starting dose or placebo. Repeat the baseline measurements, double blind protocol was followed. Cholesterol falls with red yeast rice, but not with placebo, as you'd expect, LDL drops, HDL goes up. Um, we don't always see a rise in HDL with red yeast rice. We typically don't see it with statins. CRP fell in both groups. It fell more with red yeast rice, as you'd expect. Triglycerides fell in both groups, but more with red yeast rice. Now here we've got um, triglycerides, postprandial triglycerides. This is the um, uh, the baseline, and um, and with placebo therapy, here's the red yeast rice group. So fasting triglycerides are lower, and triglycerides does not rise as much following a high fat meal. Now LPA dropped. That's interesting. LPA rises with statins. It dropped um, in this study with red yeast rice. Um, and in this study, they found that LPA rises after a high fat meal. And this is, is blunted. It's negated with red yeast rice there. Let's look at the effect of red yeast rice extract on endothelial function as assessed by flow mediated vasodilatation. So, in the placebo group at baseline and after six weeks of placebo, you see an acute reduction in endothelial function after a high fat meal. So that's why you know, we, you're more likely to have an MI after a high fat meal than after a vegan meal because the high fat intake is going to cause endothelial dysfunction. So here we have the red yeast rice group at baseline after the high fat meal, there's a decrease in endothelial function. On red yeast rice, baseline endothelial function is better and the, reduct, the acute reduction in endothelial function with a high fat meal is dramatically uh, reduced and actually prevented. Um, the improvement in postprandial endothelial function related to the relative reduction in post meal triglycerides and the change in CRP. So the red yeast rice is lowering lipids, it's lowering inflammation. If we're doing that, we're going to lower oxidative stress. Um, oxidative stress compromises endothelial function. We're lowering oxidative stress. We have a better preserved endothelial function, and the deterioration endothelial function after a high fat meal is um, abrogated. Red yeast rice and post MI event rate. Now, we're not interested just in lowering cholesterol, just in lowering oxidative stress, just in lowering inflammatory cytokine elaboration. We want a lower event rate. Now, logically, if we lower these causes of atherosclerosis and plaque destabilization, we will have lower event rate, but let's prove that. Can we do this with red yeast rice? 4,870 subjects with a prior infarct. They'd all had an MI within five years. Their mean LDL is 129. They're on standard medical therapy in China at the time of the study. Um, aspirin beta blockers, half on ACE inhibitors, um, a third on calcium blockers. Most were on long-acting nitrates. So you're going to hold all their lipid-loading therapies for four weeks. 
do the baseline studies, randomize them to red cheese rice, 600 milligrams once a day, I'm sorry, twice a day, or placebo twice a day. Not a huge dose of red cheese rice. I will point out that Chinese red cheese rice is of higher quality and potency than the red cheese rice that we're allowed to import. However, red cheese rice that is um, produced in the United States has the same potency as the Chinese red cheese rice. What happened was red cheese rice was being imported from China and it was working really well. So Merck sued the importer and the judge initially ruled for the importer saying, you know, you can't really claim a patent on the Lovastatin. It's been around for a couple thousand years. Well, the drug companies have more money than the importers and they kept suing them. So they had to stop importing high quality red yeast rice and could only uh, import low quality. But you can bypass that, that constraint if the red yeast rice is grown in the United States. And I've been using Vinco red yeast rice, which is grown in the United States. Um, and it is of high quality red cheese rice. So you got to get high quality and I like the Vinco brand. Anyways, you're going to follow them for four and a half years looking for uh, major cardiovascular events. Um, you're going to look at lipids, cardiovascular mortality, revascularization, non-cardiovascular mortality, randomized double blind study carried out at 65 hospitals um, within China. You're going to follow them for four and a half years. So standard therapy with or without red cheese rice versus placebo. So what happens, cholesterol falls a little bit with uh, placebo, so does LDL, but obviously it falls a lot more. Total cholesterol, 207, uh, LDL, 120 under 103 with red yeast rice. Triglycerides falls more. HDL rises with red yeast rice, as you'd expect. Um, major event rate over four and a half years, 45% um, risk reduction. 10.4% to 5.7%. And that's equivalent to what we get with pharmaceutical statins in the West. So really everything that a pharmaceutical statin can do, red yeast rice extract can do. Red yeast rice extract is qualitatively identical to pharmaceutical statins. It is just quantitatively less powerful. Indeed, if you took a maximal dose of red yeast rice extract, which would be 4,800 milligrams a day, that's not going to lower LVL as much as 80 milligrams of um, atorvastatin or 40 milligrams of rosuvastatin, but qualitatively, you're going to get the same thing. You're going to get this nice event reduction. So, you know, nobody can criticize us for not providing the standard of care if we substitute red yeast rice for um, pharmaceutical statins because we're achieving the same goal and we have all these randomized double blind studies to support um, uh, this maneuver. And I'm just showing you a few of the studies, there's many more. Um, event rate decreases, non fatal MI, coronary heart disease mortality, um, uh, cardiovascular mortality, um, uh, fatal MI. Uh, no change in CV, that was low in both groups. Fewer need for revascularization, um, just like um, pharmaceutical statins would do. Um, so the percent risk reduction, non-fatal MI, 62%. Cancer mortality fell by 64%. That was not a high level of statistical significance. There weren't that many cancers, but that's still a good sign. Total mortality falls by a third. Um, Reggie's rice and cytokine suppression. We want to suppress cytokines when they're pathologically over-elaborated. 82 subjects with hyperlipidemia and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, which um, hepatic steatosis is a huge problem. Um, and that is sort of the, that's the precursor of metabolic syndrome and type 2 diabetes and hyperlipidemia. Anyways, their BMI is 25, not, which is obese, but not morbidly obese. 40% are hypertensive. 36% were insulin insensitive. They'd had non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, fatty liver for eight years, and they were all hyperlipidemic, none on treatment. Dietary advice given to all, baseline studies, randomize them to Chinese red cheese rice, 600 twice a day, which is like 10 of lovastatin, or what they described as polyene phosphatidylcholine. This would be a central phospholipid, 1,2-dilinyl phosphatidylcholine. So that's not a placebo, that is an active therapy. So we're comparing one active therapy with the other, Ba repeat the baseline measures of 12 and 24 weeks. Randomized double blind protocol was followed. Um, cholesterol falls with both therapies. HDL rises with both therapies. Triglycerides falls. Fasting sugar falls. So when we use these um, nutraceuticals that work by the polyphosphatidylcholine, 
by uh, improving less than the cholesterol acetyltransferase, so you're promoting reverse cholesterol transport. We use red cheese rice to block atrium reductase, blocking the generation of cholesterol and downstream inflammatory mediators. Good things happen. Um, liver chemistries fell with both. Phosphatidylcholine is very good for the liver. There's a bunch of studies showing that um, oral and IV phosphatidylcholine is a value in liver disease. Um, um, Reggie's rice works because um, fatty liver has to do with too much lipid being generated in the liver. If we block H reductase, we're going to have a beneficial effect on fatty liver. So ALT, GGT, which is a, a marker that the um, liver is working hard to regenerate uh, glutathione because it's subject to oxidative stress, falls with both uh, therapies. Um, TNF alpha falls. Um, IL-6, these are products of nuclear factor capillary translocation. They're Th1 cytokines. They drop with both of these therapies that we commonly use with our patients. So, red yeast rice is a winner. Why not use red yeast rice to lower lipids, free radical mediators, cytokines, inflammatory mediators in our patients with cardiovascular disease? Red yeast rice extract like statins blocks h reductase. We're going to block generation of cholesterol. We're going to block generation of isoprenoids. We're going to block rho kinase. We're going to block assembly of NADPH oxidase. We're going to block the generation of superoxide. If we block superoxide, less nuclear factor capillary translocation, less elaboration of inflammatory mediators. We're going to block hyperlipidemia. We're going to block oxidative stress. We're going to block inappropriate generation of inflammatory mediators, thus a value in the patient with cardiovascular disease. There is a rare patient who cannot tolerate red yeast rice extract. Some patients who are exquisitely sensitive to statins cannot tolerate red yeast rice extract, even with coenzyme Q. Perhaps they have a unique genetic situation where they cannot tolerate these molecules. Perhaps their body says, gee, I need cholesterol for other purposes. I'm going to resist any attempt to lower cholesterol, but most patients can tolerate red yeast rice. However, if you can't tolerate red yeast rice, we have other options such as oil of bergamot. Oil of bergamot. So the bergamot plant grows best in a specific section of uh, Italy. I think it's Ionia. And the plant is quite colorful and creates a fruit that is sort of plum-like in characteristic. And the um, compounds from bergamot are used to tan leather. It's used in some high-end uh, ladies' accessories. Um, uh, a, a component of the bergamot provides the flavor of Earl Grey tea. So from our point of view, what they do is they take the, um, the fruit and they scrunch it and get all the juice out and put it into a tablet form. And we use that to block the activity of HMG reductase, just as we use statins, just as we use Reggie's rice extract. So here, let's compare bergamot, a nutraceutical, versus rosuvastatin, which is Crestor, which of the pharmaceutical lip lowering agents seems to be the most effective and the best tolerated. Um, if your patients are having trouble with statins, you can use rosuvastatin and you can treat them um, every other day or three days a week, and almost everybody will tolerate that. So it's my favorite statin if I want to use a pharmaceutical statin. So we're going to take 77 subjects with mixed hyperlipidemia, baseline measurements, advise all to follow a low-fat diet, randomize them to receive placebo, rosuvastatin at 10 milligrams, rosuvastatin at 20, bergamot at 1,000, or combination therapy, rosuvastatin with 10, bergamot 1,000, repeat the baseline studies at 30 days. Okay, so placebo doesn't do anything for uh, cholesterol. It's up, you know, in the high 270s. LVL is 190. Rosuvastatin 10 worked. Rosuvastatin 20 worked a little bit better. Bergamot 10 worked as well as Rosuvastatin 10 at lowering cholesterol and LDL. Combination therapy of rosuvastatin 10 and berberine 1000 worked as well as rosuvastatin 20. So basically berberine and 1000 bergamot, I'm sorry, bergamot at 1000 worked as well as rosuvastatin 10 and of course there was a synergy because they both do the same thing. They block H reductase via slightly different uh, mechanisms.
HDL rises a little bit with Superstatin 10 and 20, rises a little bit with berberine, bergamot 10, and uh, there's a synergy between um, resuvastatin 10 and bergamot um, 1000, same situation with triglycerides. So you could interchange resuvastatin with bergamot and you can use them together because there's a synergy because they're affecting the enzyme via slightly different mechanisms that appear to synergize. Now, um, when we block h and reductase, the first biochemical phenomenon will be a decrease in mevalonic acid. So to prove that you're blocking h reductase, you would see a reduction in urine mevalonic acid. And you can see this occurs with resuvastatin 10, resuvastatin 20, um, bergamot, and combination therapy. Thus, the components of bergamot inhibit h reductase. That is how they're exerting a hypolipidemic and antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effect. So with both bergamot and resuvastatin therapy, we are lowering the generation of mevalonic acid. We will be lowering the generation of isoprenoids. We'll be blocking assembly of NADPH oxidase. We're going to be lowering superoxide. So of course, we will see a reduction in malon aldehyde within peripheral mononuclear cells, um, resuvastatin 10, resuvastatin 20, uh, bergamot 1000, and we see synergy. The LOX receptor is deleterious. It's a receptor for oxidized LDL. Its expression will be increased in the presence of hyperlipidemia, and we can block it with both resuvastatin and with um, uh, bergamot. And of course, there's a synergy, as you'd expect. Um, protein kinase B, we want to downregulate that pathophysiology. It is downregulated with the pharmaceutical statin, with the nutraceutical statin and there is a, um, a synergy. So what we call the pleiotropic effects of statins are really their antioxidant and anti-inflammatory effects having to do with downregulation of NADPA oxidase. Everything else is downstream to that, and we can achieve this with uh, pharmaceutical statins and with our nutraceutical statins, such as Reggie's rice extract or a uh, bergamot. Let's look at bergamot versus hyperlipidemia and metabolic syndrome. 237 subjects with dyslipidemia. 104 had isolated hypercholesterolemia with an LDL above 130. 42 had elevations in LDL and triglycerides. 59 had metabolic syndrome, hyperlipidemia, high sugar, overweight, hypertension, low HDL, etc. Baseline measurements were on a low fat diet, randomized them to placebo, bergamot, low dose 500, bergamot, high dose 1000. Repeat the baseline studies at 30 days, double my protocol followed. Then another study, we're going to look at 37 subjects who were intolerant to simvastatin. Muscle pain elevated CPK. So these 32 simvastatin intolerant patients are going to get bergamot 1500 milligrams a day. As an alternative, repeat the labs at 30 days. So treatment effect in those with pure hypercholesterolemia, those with mixed hyperlipidemia. Um, placebo therapy had no effect, and you can see a 21% reduction in cholesterol with bergamot at, at um, 500, a 31% um, reduction with bergamot at 1,000. They looked at overall, and then the 10% of the subjects of the best responders, they had a better um, hypolipidemic effect. Um, the same situation with LDL um, and the rise in HDL. This was in the individuals with pure hypercholesterolemia and those with mixed hyperlipidemia. So some of us are probably um, better able to respond to um, h reductase inhibition, perhaps with pharmaceuticals and here with um, a bergamot than others. But the, the message is there's a dose-related reduction in lipids in those with pure hyperlipidemia and those with mixed hyperlipidemia. If you look at the treatment effect of the metabolic syndrome, there's a benefit with cholesterol, LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and glucose um, that is dose-related. You're going to lower cholesterol. You're going to lower LDL. You're going to be blocking any DPH oxidase generation. So all the downstream benefits of statin therapy are recapitulated with bergamot and red cheese rice extract and any other methodology that we could come up with to block the activity of HMG co-reductase. Um, again, HDL rises, triglycerides fall, fasting sugar falls a little bit. Fasting sugar rises with statins. It improves with bergamot and with berberine and with, a little bit with Reggie's rice extract. Um, now, what about the patients who are simvastatin intolerant? 
Those are the ones that we're really looking for a help with. So here we take these people that can't tolerate a resuvastatin. You put them on 1,500 bergamot. You see cholesterol falls from 290 to 205, LDL from 220 to 150, HDL rises, um, beneficial effects on cholesterol, LDL, and HDL in individuals who cannot tolerate pharmaceutical statin therapy. So oil of bergamot is a winner, like Reggie's rice, uh, like bergamot. Um, and if we can't get our hands on bergamot or Reggie's rice, or the patient cannot tolerate those, we have another alternative, which is AMLA, which is Indian wild gooseberry, which is used extensively in Indian medicine. The botanical name is um, Amlica officinalis. It's actually used as a candy, um, as a candy treat um, in India. And we will, uh, you can, you can uh, ex express um, the juice from the plant and put it into a tablet. And we're going to use it to block the activity of H. reductase. Um. So what about AMLA in hyperlipidemia? 30 hyperlipidemic subjects, baseline measures, advise all regarding low fat diet, regular exercise. Put 15 with the cholesterol above 240 on Amlimax, 500 milligrams twice a day. This is a standardized extract. It has been patented. So if you take Amlimax, you know you're getting the real stuff. 15 with um, cholesterol between 200 and 240. They're assigned to diet and exercise alone. Predict lab assessment over four months. No side effects, no change in hepatic or renal chemistries. Of interest, hemoglobin rises with AMLA, but not with controls. Now, that was kind of interesting. I don't know why hemoglobin rose, but I thought that was an interesting and probably positive uh, uh, co-benefit of AMLA. Um, total cholesterol, here we've got baseline, 4 weeks, 8 weeks, 12 and 16 weeks. Nothing's happening with the controls. Cholesterol is falling from 280 to 231. LDL from 202 to 157. Nothing's happening with the controls. Um, HDL rises, triglycerides falls, nothing's happening with controls. Well tolerated in safe therapy, there's an anabolic hematopoietic effect. LDL and triglyceride reduction uh, coupled with a um, rise in HDL. And so you get a 21% drop in LDL with a 14% rise in HDL with AMLA. AMLA versus hyperlipidemia and inflammation. 39 subjects with hyperlipidemia, cholesterol 190 to 310, and their CRPs were elevated 1.5 to 5. If I had to follow their usual dietary and exercise habits, it assigned them to receive over six months, AMLA max 500 at bedtime, AMLA max 1000 at bedtime, peric assessment of lab values. Cholesterol falls with AMLA 500 and with AMLA 1000. No real difference in efficacy here. LDL drops the same amount with 500 versus AMLA 1000. Um, HDL rises um, with both groups. Triglycerides falls with both groups. Um, fasting sugar falls. C-reactive protein falls. 500 seems to work as well as 1000 in this patient population. Now let's compare AMLA to simvastatin. We've already compared bergamot to resuvastatin. Here let's compare AMLA to simvastatin. Uh, 60 subjects with type 2 hyperlipidemia, LDL is above 130, two other risk factors, male uh, versus female, hypertension, low HDL, ongoing smoking, or high BMI, basically um, male gender or metabolic syndrome components, um, increasing the relative risk of their hyperlipidemia with respect to generating um, uh, atherosclerosis. Baseline lipid values, uh, signed to receive at night. AMLA, 500 milligrams. This was made by Pharma Intel in Kolkata, India, from dried amla fruit powder, or simvastatin 20. Repeat the measurements at six weeks. So, what effect do we see with amla or simvastatin with respect to lipid control? Both simvastatin and amla lowered cholesterol and LDL to the same degree. HDL rose a little bit with both groups. Typically, we don't see an HDL rise with simvastatin. Here we did. We see it with AMLA, and we see a modest effect on triglycerides. It, uh, here, simvastatin was a little bit more effective than was AMLA. Um, so AMLA, like uh, red yeast rice, like bergamot, blocks h reductase, blocks superoxide generation, all the benefits of statin therapy we recapitulated with these nutraceutical statins with a lower cost and a lower potential for side effects.
The fourth nutraceutical that we can use to inhibit HMG CoA reductase activity is delta tocotrienol. So the HMG CoA reductase has a catalytic domain that converts HMG into mevalonate and then downstream to generate cholesterol. There's a regulatory domain that is embedded into the um, um, membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, and it has a sterile sensing function. Now, we know that SCAP and INSIG are uh, measuring sterile levels within the cytoplasm, and when there's plenty of sterile, um, SREBP is sequestered in the endoplasmic reticulum. When there's low levels of sterile, um, a SCAP let, takes um, SREBP to the Golgi, trims it, and it goes into the nucleus. So it's going to translocate to the nucleus um, only when there's sterile deficiency. When there's adequate steroles, we don't translocate SREBP to the nucleus. Likewise, when there's plenty of sterile in the cell, um, HM reductase will be ubiquinated and degraded. So the more sterile in the cell, the more likely, you know, we're transcribing some HM reductase, and if we don't want to generate cholesterol because there's enough cholesterol, we will degrade it and you ubiquinate it, and then it is degraded in the um, proteasome. Now, um, delta tocotrienols promote ubiquination of HM reductase. So they don't directly block HM reductase but they promote its degradation. If we degrade the stuff, it will become inactive. So tocotrienols will, will degrade h um, which will achieve the same goal as if we block it with a pharmaceutical or with a nutraceutical stat. And of course, there might be a synergy here because they're working via slightly different pathways. Um, what effect will this have clinically? This study was carried out in Malaysia where they, they can uh, generate palm oil and refine it into a product that is rich in tocotrienols. And the trade name is Palm Viti, and it has 40 milligrams of gamma and alpha tocotrienol. Now, this is tocotrienol, not tocopherol. Vitamin E won't do that, but tocotrienol will. 50 subjects with symptomatic cry disease, TIA or non-disabling CVA, they all had moderate carotid narrowings, 15 to 79%. So these are carotid narrowings that are symptomatic. Record at baseline lipids, T-bars, which is a marker of oxidative stress, the severity of the carotid narrowing, and they would put you into brackets, 0 to 15, 16 to 49, 50 to 79, 80 to 99. You randomize to placebo or palm viti, the tocotrienol preparation. You reassess at one to two years. All standard therapies were continued except for statins. So what you see here, we have um, LDL cholesterol drops a little bit um, with placebo therapy. It goes up slightly and then falls with tocotrienol therapy. You're blocking. We are. You're not blocking H1 reductase. You're degrading it by promoting its ubiquination. Um, HDL rises a little bit with placebo. It rises a little bit with tocotrienol. T bars, a marker of oxidative stress. There's not much of a net change with placebo. It does fall with tocotrienol, as you would expect, because if you, if you by degrading H1 reductase, you're making um, less um, superoxide. Carotid status at six months. So um, progression would be going from one bracket to the next. Mark progression would be going from one bracket, you're going to jump up two. Likewise, regression would be decreasing a bracket. Marked regression would be decreasing two brackets. So most of these people at six months and at 24 months were unchanged, but there was a net improvement with the tocotrienol therapy. There was progression and marked progression far more frequently with placebo therapy than with tocotrienol therapy. In fact, there was a regression and some degree of marked regression with um, tocotrienol therapy. So there was anatomic regression of carotid atherosclerosis with tocotrienol therapy. So we're gonna take an integrative approach to dealing with oxidative stress. Oxidative stress is the key initiator and driver of atherosclerosis, and it plays a key role in the pathogenesis of congestive heart failure. So we're going to throw cold water on the oxidative fire with exogenous antioxidants. We're going to use NERF2 translocators to increase transcription of, of our uh, antioxidant detox enzyme systems. All the drugs that we use in allopathic cardiology 
to achieve a goal, either lipid reduction or blood pressure reduction or symptom reduction that concomitantly improve outcome. In common, they all block the generation of superoxide and downstream inflammatory mediators. We will use lipophilic um, ACE inhibitors. We can use statins, pharmaceutical or nutraceutical, beta blockers, um, um, colchicine to block NLRP3 activation, xanthine oxidase inhibition with allopurinol to block superoxide generation. We can use these agents not just to lower blood pressure, uric acid, and cholesterol, but to lower blood pressure, uric acid, and cholesterol while blocking the generation of oxidative inflammatory mediators. And of course, in the long run, we want to prevent the development of the circulation. We want our patients to follow a prudent diet, to lose weight, to get enough sleep, to deal with metals, to deal with toxins. Unfortunately, we're not existing in the Garden of Eden. If we did, we would not need to take antioxidants. But because we are uh, being exposed to all these toxins, we need to measure our toxic burden. We need to get rid of it. And until we do so, we can use exogenous antioxidants and then drugs to block the generation of superoxide and other uh, undesirable uh, proatherosclerotic oxidative inflammatory mediator. So this completes the bonus coverage section of our presentation, and it's only fitting that we will terminate this marathon presentation with this slide showing myself and our daughter, Major Catherine Roberts, the best looking hepatologist in the U.S. Army Medical system completing a marathon. Catherine is finishing her fourth year in gastroenterology. She just found out she's going to be assigned to Fort Bragg, the largest military installation in the world, where she will be initiating their hepatology program. And the Fort Bragg Military Hospital is also going to be starting a residency training program, so she'll be involved in training younger physicians. So certainly the hepatic health of the U.S. Army is going to improve dramatically, and you might expect from me um, uh, discussions with titles such as cardiohepatology, those are in the works. So that completes our presentation, Integrative Cardiology for the Chelating Physician. I appreciate your attention. I hope you get a lot out of this and you can this information to help your patients. And then we can all work together to make Ted proud and to fulfill the Rosama prophecy. Thank you very much.